June 10, 1999. By all accounts, it was a beautiful late spring Thursday in Bellingham, Washington. By 4 p.m., residents of this seaside community of 65,000 were already home for the day. Jubilant children recently let out of school were headed to one of the many old growth shrouded parks and playgrounds near their homes. Certainly, no one had any reason to believe that this community would very soon be turned into the scene of a horrific disaster site and that one beloved park, the community's trust, wildlife by the thousands, and three Bellingham lives would soon be destroyed. Bellingham has several beautiful urban parks, and in 1999, Whatcom Falls Park was arguably its finest. A genuine 240-acre jewel, the park and its old-growth forested creeks, waterfalls, and pools were a place of quiet and serene walks on shaded, cool trails. Parents and children came to look at tiny trout in the park's state-run hatchery, and bigger kids often repeated the antics of generations of children before them. Tim Wall is with the Bellingham Parks and Recreation Department and has vivid childhood memories of playing in Whatcom Falls Park. We didn't have a lot of the trails that we have now. We didn't have a, a community that, that walked or biked as much, but we did. We'd go deep into the into the recesses of the gorge, as we call it, um, to get away from everybody and to, to see these incredible waterfalls and, and to sit in the water and, and dive in. There were some great little swimming holes all up and down. A stone bridge at the Upper Falls on Whatcom Creek is a city icon, a beautiful legacy of chuckanut sandstone built during the lingering Great Depression in 1939. The creek itself relinquished occasional trout to skilled anglers, and the forested ravines provided secret hiding places for imaginative children. Also along the creek is the city's only water treatment plant, gathering water from Lake Whatcom a few miles upstream at the start of Whatcom Creek. Downstream, the creek leaves the park and becomes an urban stream in a forested corridor as it twists its way two miles through crowded commercial, residential, and retail neighborhoods to Bellingham Bay and the sea. But on the afternoon of June 10, 1999, things began to unravel in Whatcom Falls Park. One of the first individuals in Bellingham to become aware of anything out of the ordinary was Ryan Provincher. In 1999, Ryan had been with the Bellingham Fire Department for two years. He was part of an engine company responding to a routine 911 call. And a call came in for uh, an odor investigation. So th that's a very routine call. There was certainly no indication of any sense of urgency or anything out of the ordinary. So we responded to uh, the corner there at uh, Iowa and uh, Woburn Street. And uh, Captain Jaquish got out to investigate and I was still in the aid rig that I was driving, and I could see from where I was sitting that his eyes got huge as he looked over the bridge. And right then I knew that this was a little bigger than what we thought it was gonna be. The bridge at Woburn and Iowa Streets crosses Whatcom Creek as it spills out of Whatcom Falls Park and heads toward downtown Bellingham. The routine odor investigation was from calls about a gasoline smell in the vicinity. Gasoline has a very distinct smell, and even a trivial amount of it can release a very strong odor. But what the firefighters saw when they looked down on the creek as it passed under the bridge was no small amount. It looked like a, a river of gasoline. Just couldn't, couldn't believe what I was seeing. I mean, it was literally um, just free-flowing uh, gasoline, and the vapors went as high as you could see. It just, it just blurred the whole landscape behind the creek. Uh, the vapors were so thick. The first responders' simple odor investigation had now escalated into a full-scale material spill of enormous proportions. It was clearly not a matter of if, but rather when the vapors and gasoline would ignite. The area needed to be secured, the source of the spill located, and citizens evacuated from the park. More fire and police units were dispatched. 
Ron Morehouse is the fire department's battalion chief, and at this point he arrived at the Woburn Street site and established a command center. It just seemed inevitable that something was going to happen, so my main concern was to get people evacuated and, and try not to have any of our people in the way at the time. There were so many fumes and it was, uh, like I say, normally we get a little bit of a south wind there. I just couldn't imagine those, that many fumes blowing through that many businesses and households. And, and of course, it, right away I didn't know whether it uh, went to the freeway or not. The one, one thing that was kind of good is that uh, they got Woburn and Valencia closed right away, which are the only bridges until you get to the freeway. So there weren't people driving through it. but. Uh, uh, I just didn't believe that uh, we could be so fortunate for there to be that much fumes and product going down the creek and not find an ignition source somewhere. By now, a growing number of concerned residents were smelling gasoline and calling both 911 and KGMI radio to report the odor. KGMI radio called the fire department's public information officer, Bill Boyd, to find out what exactly was happening. But Bill was at home that day, and he didn't know about this problem, yet. I hadn't been made aware of it, so I said, hang on, I'll call you back. So I called our dispatch center, and they said, uh, in fact, they had some kind of unknown fuel leak. It appeared to be fairly large, and that they were going to be shutting down several streets uh, along Iowa and Woburn. Well... That's a big deal because it was coming up on rush hour, so I felt like I needed to get that information out to the media. So I called back to KGMI. Uh, they said, hang on just a minute, we'll put you live, and you can give a report. Uh, about that time, the phone went dead. Meanwhile, in an effort to find out where all this gasoline was coming from, firefighters Ryan Provencher and Kelly Devlin were assigned to drive around to the entrance of Whatcom Falls Park, evacuate anyone there, and see if they could find the source of the fuel spill. So he and I jumped into the aid rig that I was driving. We went in to Whatcom Falls Park and started walking towards the water treatment plant, just trying to get an idea of where this was coming from. And as we walked, you know, we would pass by people and we'd ask them, you know, did they see anything, did they smell anything? No, 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 there was no evidence of anything from the direction that we were coming. And um, we were just crossing the little footbridge towards the water treatment plant when the explosion occurred. The flames and smoke uh, came down the valley uh, out of the park and all I remember is it, it just it completely filled the, the V of the valley there and the trees, and it was above the, the fireball was above the trees. Just a huge boom. And then it sounded basically like a jet plane flying through the creek bed. It was just a, just a rumbling sound. So we definitely were lucky that, that we weren't closer than we were. All I remember th thinking was I thought, well, you know, there's just a, there's, you know, product on the creek can't, can't be that much. It's just going to, you know, burn for a few minutes and then, and then it's going to die down and the problem will, problem will start going away. And I remember it was like 15 or 20 minutes. It's still just roaring. And I, and I, I'm just going, my, my God, what have we got? I, I just couldn't imagine that there was that much product that it didn't, just kind of burn right off. 911, uh, there's a big smoke. The sky is smoking. Okay. 911, yes, I'd like to uh, report an explosion. Okay. Top of Alabama Hill. 911. Yeah, I'm sure you've already received a call about a huge fire on Alabama Hill. Okay. 911? Yeah, I'm on Iowa Street and I just saw like a very big explosion. Do you know what exploded? 911. There's been an explosion. And this is a whole sky is black. 911. Yeah, um, my power just went off and there was a big boom outside. Right, we're, we are on scene. Okay. Immediately after the explosion, the huge black ball of smoke that engulfed the creek was visible for miles. The sound of the explosion was muffled by the thick forest around the blast site and it wasn't heard throughout the city. Only those close enough to smell the fumes could know that the towering black wall had anything to do with a burning river of gasoline. 
my neighbor came running down the street screaming, saying, what's going on in town? What's going on in town? And I said, well, we've got a gas leak, and I'm going down to find out. She goes, no, there's something else. She goes, look. And I turned around and, and saw this unbelievable wall of boiling smoke uh, rising up straight up in the air. And uh, about that time, my wife came out, and I just basically said, don't count on me coming home tonight. Um, I'll see you probably sometime tomorrow. For everyone else, including the press, the massive column of smoke was a mystery of unguessed origin. And the sky was just filled with this black cloud. And it was moving, as we looked at it, from right to left. It was moving downstream. And because what we'd heard on the scanner earlier, we knew that it was the creek that was blowing up, basically. Uh, we didn't really understand exactly why, but we knew that's where the explosion was. We couldn't, the scanners and those sorts of things stopped working. The, the police and the fire department people couldn't get through. Everybody was using their cell phone. The phone lines were down. Power went out in parts of town. And uh, it became kind of a scramble to make sure that we could figure out all the things that were happening and why. Uh, you know, I remember being over there and watching the flames and thinking, this is unbelievable. I just, you, there are no words when you're watching something like that. It was like a blowtorch. As the deadly flames and smoke roared downstream, consuming hundreds of thousands of gallons of gasoline that had spilled from somewhere into the creek, property and life alongside the creek were in immediate peril. As the firestorm left the park, it entered a residential and heavily commercial area behind Bellingham's Auto Row on Iowa Street. Beyond that was the freeway and then more residential neighborhood, the Civic Center and downtown Bellingham, before entering the bay at Georgia Pacific's pulp mill. But time and resources were limited. The fire was moving like a freight train down the creek in its unchecked advance toward the sea. Carl Weimer was the executive director of the ReStore at the mouth of Whatcom Creek in 1999. Growing over the top of Bellingham was this ghastly black cloud that looked like an atomic explosion. And we all stood there stunned and we turned on the radio trying to figure out what was going on and it took a long time for there to be an announcement that there was fuel in the creek and it was running down Whatcom Creek. Well, we were standing looking right at Whatcom Creek and realized we needed to get out of there. Um, we rushed around, locked up the store, made sure no one was in, and then all got out of town. And I lived in Ferndale at the time, and I uh, actually took out to get out of town because I knew enough about air quality issues. I was really worried about what was in that cloud as it came back down, uh, listening to the radio on the way. And the cloud affected me emotionally in a way that I have never been affected before, and I actually had to stop my car before I got... Uh, all the way back to Ferndale and, and just stop and get out and breathe because it was such a scary thing seeing that cloud. Well, I was at the Bellingham City Council offices and uh, myself and some other city council members were picking up our packet uh, for our Monday meeting, which we do generally every Thursday. And someone came through the uh, council offices and said we need to evacuate the building. It was clear as the fire event unfolded that not only emergency services would be called into play, but soon important executive decisions would have to be made. The mayor, Mark Osmondson, was on a trip in Russia. By city charter, this placed Councilman Pat Rowe, who was the mayor pro tem, in the city's executive position. As we're leaving the building, we could actually see the smoke from the uh, city council outside the city council chambers. And it was mentioned to me at that time by one of the other city council members that, listen, you're made mayor pro tem, you may be put into action. We don't know what it is yet. By now, emergency officials were becoming acutely aware of where all this gasoline in the creek was actually coming from. The only way that we could have that much fuel in the creek is because, is, was due to a ruptured pipeline. Originally, we thought maybe there was a tank car that overturned up off of Electric Avenue, got into the creek and came downstream, but it, we quickly realized that can't be the case. We knew there were two pipelines that crossed that, cross Whatcom Creek, one was trans, at that time was Trans Mountain, and the other one at that time was Olympic Pipeline. And uh, we had representatives from both organizations, both companies show up at the scene and the Olympic Pipeline person actually was there first 
uh, and said, we think this is our pipeline. Interestingly enough, the Olympic pipeline person that showed up was either a chemist or some kind of employee who lived in the area and was driving home through that area, smelled the fuel, called back to his office to say, you got something going on with the pipeline? And they essentially said, we're not sure yet, we're looking into it. And he went, you know, this has got to be our pipeline. And he made contact with our incident commander fairly soon, fairly early on in the incident. Everyone's most dreaded expectations were met when two boys aged 10, Wade King and Stephen Sorvis, who were playing together in the park, were found horribly burned. Second and third degree burns covered 90% of their bodies. Ambulances were hindered by streets clogged with vehicles and drivers trying to get a closer view of the wall of smoke. The boys were able to talk for a while. Wade asked that his mother not look at him because he didn't want her upset. Later, a first responder would say that when Stephen asked me if he was going to die, I knew the answer was yes, but I couldn't tell him the truth. All I could say was, we're going to take good care of you. A third young man, Liam Wood, had just graduated from high school. He was an avid fly fisherman and had come to one of his favorite holes in the creek to try his luck. Liam was found dead in the creek, apparently overcome by thick gasoline fumes when the water turned milky white and the canyon filled with a toxic vapor cloud. Liam was overcome by the vapor, fell into the creek he loved, and drowned. Uh, the firefighters who treated the, the two uh, severely injured boys that subsequently died um, were uh, significantly impacted, uh, one of which has, uh, shortly thereafter um, uh, gave up his paramedic certification and basically said, I can't do this anymore. He had a child that was about the same age and just said, you know, I just, I can't do it. Uh, the other paramedic that was involved, uh, he has kept his certification, uh, but he was significantly uh, impacted and affected as well. Um, we see things in the fire service that no, nobody should have to see. We know that when we sign up, it takes a special person to deal with it, but uh, everybody has their, their point at which they struggle with dealing with situations. And uh, this was probably one of the most horrific um, medical situations that we had to face, we being as a fire department. And uh, the paramedics and EMTs that responded and helped those kids out gave them the, the, the greatest possible chance of survival. But they knew early on there was no way. And that's tough to deal with. Although the gasoline moved all the way down Watkin Creek to Bellingham Bay, for some inexplicable reason, the killer fireball itself stopped miraculously at a point in the creek just short of the freeway, sparing everything further downstream from the hellish nightmare that had just suffocated and broiled the upper creek and everything in it. Earl Steele runs the hatchery at Maritime Heritage Park, two miles further downstream from where the fireball stopped. We lost approximately 18,000 rainbow trout. Uh, they were in the hatchery. They were just very small fry. Uh, and so it was a very low number of fish that we actually lost. We had just released 1.2 million fall Chinook two weeks earlier, and it was right around 10,000 pounds of fish. But the event was not over yet. The fires continued to rage along the upper creek and on private property adjacent to the creek. And then, just as things were settling down about 10 p.m., Public Works reported highly explosive gasoline vapor levels in the sewer system. Ron Morehouse remembers the chill this sent down his spine as he began organizing evacuation of a major portion of the city. And uh, I remember thinking at that point that, uh, that I'm going to blow up Bellingham just like Mexico City, you know, with all this gasoline in the, in the sewers. So uh, we started talking about a plan to evacuate basically the, 
you know, the post office had already evacuated. We talked about, you know, what else are we going to have to evacuate? I, I remember do, reporting a story where the fire chief, it did get into the sewer system, and there was a, they had all the buses lined up to evacuate the entire city, and they were worried that the gas was in the sewer system and that it was going to blow up into everybody's bathroom and kitchen. And the fire chief, they were just about to make the evacuation call when he said, let's test it one more time. And they put a probe down into a manhole cover and it just started to go down and they called off the evacuation. So there was a lot of uh, weird stuff going on and it could have been, I mean, the whole town could have burned down. I remember uh, uh, the look on Dale Bramlin's face when uh, I told him we were gonna have to evacuate the jail. He says, I've got 204 inmates and I think three jailers. He says, we're, we're gonna just have to let them open the doors and let them go. At that time, there were some state uh, officials and, and national officials, uh, safety officials uh, that were coming in. They made it there very quickly uh, to have a discussion about what was happening. And as we were sitting in that meeting, everybody was trying to talk about uh, who should do what, who, who is in charge of this and who's in charge of that. I jumped in and said, listen, the city of Bellingham is in control Tell." in control of everything until we decide otherwise. And all of the other agencies there from the state and the federal uh, agencies suggested, yes, that is indeed the case. That was a very important thing to get handled and taken care of because now everybody was aware uh, that the city of Bellingham was in charge. Another major concern was Bellingham's water treatment plant, which sits very close to the spot where the Olympic pipeline crosses Whatcom Creek. The area was ground zero. A crater large enough to hold a truck had been blasted by the explosion here, and although the treatment plant itself sustained little damage, the pump house was nearly destroyed, and temporary pumps were flown in as replacements. The damage to the creek and land downstream from this site for two miles was unbelievable. It was, it was overwhelming to, to walk through there and, and just see the, the aftermath, it, it was over, very overwhelming and, and sad and, and just, I remember wondering at the time, how, how are we ever gonna fix this? I, uh, the, what it hit me the strongest was how fast something so precious, something that we enjoyed, the, the rocks we sat on that are covered with moss and ferns, how fast that took to burn up. That was my, my main thought, was just how quickly we can destroy something. By the third day of the event, Mayor Mark Osmondson was back in Bellingham from Russia. The first item on his agenda was a tour of the site. When I got on site, even though it had exploded when I was in Russia, when I first um, came back to Bellingham, and which was like, two and a half days after the election by the time I finally got to Bellingham uh, and got to the site of the explosion behind the water treatment plant, the ground was still burning. It wasn't smoking, it was still in flames. And then I walked along the creek and my reaction was, holy mother of God, what has happened here? This is just unimaginable. And, and then in talking, of course, to people that were it, in the vicinity uh, 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 and, and physically saw the, the plume of smoke and stuff. Um, I mean, these are, th th people will never forget that day. And, um, and I'll never forget the sense of determination and resolve I had that we were going to do something about it. Um, I think going to the site immediately upon coming to Bellingham, uh, it was part of what, um, I don't know if the word is stiffened my spine or uh, uh, um, galvanized my determination, but it really created a basis for an intensive focus on making change. On June 10th, 1999, over 230,000 gallons of gasoline were dumped into Hanna and Whatcom Creeks as the pipeline split and dumped fuel unchecked into the waterways.
The event was not an isolated accident. It was caused by a series of problems at Olympic Pipeline and its operation and maintenance of its pipeline. If any of these problems had been corrected in a timely manner, the tragedy would not have occurred. At the time this pipeline blew up here in Bellingham, there was no regulation that once you put a pipeline in the ground, you ever had to inspect it again. And we have pipelines that are 60, 70, 80 years old in the ground, and there was no regulation that said you ever had to inspect it again. The city had had a franchise agreement with the pipeline company for a number of years, which had expired in the early 90s. And the uh, city tried to negotiate a new plan uh, had been basically resisted by the pipeline company. So the pipeline company, by their own decision, was on a month-to-month -month basis uh, on a franchise agreement. And instead of paying at the first of the month, they were paying at the end of the month. So technically, at the time of the blast, they had not paid their franchise fee or out of compliance. So there was no agreement for the use of that park property at the time of the explosion, which gave Mayor Osmondson some leverage for saying to Olympic, oh, our easement agreement has expired. We're not going to give you an agreement. We want the pipeline shut down until you meet our demands. And that's, that's kind of the leveraged cooperative agreement that came out of Bellingham. They never took it to court to find out how far the mayor could get away with trying to set pipeline regulations that way, because Olympic went along. Um, and then as the facts came out, it, it was even more clear why this tragedy happened because, um, the, the, because of the negligence of, uh, uh, of a company as well as the um, lack of aggressive laws and regulations uh, that gave direction on how we should be testing these pipelines. I think one of the ways that Bellingham responded uniquely that you don't see in other places with disasters like this. We really came together to help not only those families, but the community in general heal. Uh, and we stepped up and decided that we were going to take this disaster and turn it into the best we could out of it. And I think there was some significant community building that went on because of that, both restoring the creek and uh, really uh, marching on the federal government to change pipeline safety so it wouldn't happen to any other community. It's, it's tragic that those incidents had to happen to wake up Congress and the pipeline industry for the need for improving our pipeline safety laws. But it is a legacy as well for the families that the, that the pipeline safety laws have, have increased because of their continued activism as a result of these tragedies. As human beings, we have the ability to choose how we are going to react to those bad things. And um, I think the way Bellingham reacted, I think the way Bellingham community citizens reacted, the way city government reacted, and ultimately the way our state and federal legislative bodies reacted, created the, po the only positive outcome that you could look for, which is a dramatic reduction in the likelihood that such an event will occur again. In addition to the work of strengthening local and federal regulation of pipeline safety and restoring the community's sense of safety, the city also started work on repairing the overwhelming environmental disaster along the Whatcom Creek Corridor that had been destroyed by fire and explosion. Claire Fogelsong is the city's environmental resources manager. And over the course of that first couple of days to a week, we realized that everything was dead. Uh, all, the, all the insects, all the fish, any birds that had been in the area, um, all the other aquatic, um, like lampreys and, and crawfish and things. There were just big piles of them all, all down the stream where they had collected in eddies. And that was um, pretty saddening. Um, we could still conjure up that sadness pretty easily. It was. Um, from an e ecologist's point of view, it was pretty uh, devastating to think that a whole stream had been wiped out. Claire worked on the city's negotiation team to establish a settlement that would pay for restoring the damaged site and mitigate the loss to the community. In that regard, he met immediately with negotiators from Olympic Pipeline. It was, it was very obvious from the beginning they had a lot of practice, and that was comforting on one level, but discomforting when you thought that they 
they're used to this. And they were sort of entertaining because they had such an attitude that was way too big for the room. One of the consultants showed up with a, uh, a 10 gallon hat, you know, cowboy hat, but they were required to wear hard hats up at the, up at the water treatment plant. So this was a plastic 10 gallon hat that, was, that met the specs for hard hats. And I thought that was pretty entertaining. Rene LaCroix is one of the city's environmental coordinators. For the past 10 years, she's been managing restoration projects along Whatcom Creek in the area devastated by the fire. Because of the settlement, the city ended up with um, a substantial amount of new property um, that came to the city as part of the settlement, and we also received some settlement money. And so between those two, we were in a very good position to go in and do some pretty large-scale projects. Um, there's a group of trustees that helped formulate the restoration plan and they came up with a lot of different project ideas and there were three large-scale projects that resulted from all of that um, the cemetery creek project the salmon park project and the red tail reach project and both um, the cemetery creek and the salmon park project were constructed in 2006 and they're both large-scale projects that were meant to increase the salmon habitat available in the whatcom creek system um, the Cemetery Creek project re-meandered an entire section of Cemetery Creek that had been ditched previously, um, created riffles and pools and bends and meanders and large woody debris. We also created three large, um, what we call inline pools. They were just pools that were all along different stretches of Cemetery Creek, and all that contributes to the habitat diversity in the Whatcom Creek system. Um, and then the Salmon Park project was um, allowed the creek to meander into a, a historic backwater area, and that backwater area had been cut off from the main stem of Whatcom Creek from dredging and taking the dredged spoils and putting them in a berm type situation. So the creek wasn't allowed to overflow into this old backwater area. And so we ended up um, excavating out part of the berm and then letting the river excavate out the rest of the berm. So now it can inundate this old backwater area. Again, great juvenile habitat. Um, one of the most amazing things that's that I've seen happen in Whatcom Creek is that as a result of the fire, a lot of the trees, most of the trees right along the stream banks were burned. And in the 10 years since then, a lot of those trees have fallen into the creek because of the wind. Um, and that large woody debris ends up in log jams and that log jams, the log jams force the creek to meander, to bend to meander. And so for years, Whatcom Creek was very straight um, and it had berms on both sides from the dredging. And so as a result of the fire, and all this wood that had entered the system, it now has bends and meanders and has a much more natural riffle pool ratio. And so there's much more habitat available in Whatcom Creek than there ever was even previous to the fire. I think if you can go to any one place as a, as a pedestrian and, and, see the, and, and see things, I would go to, the, uh, to where the north end of Racine Street butts up against the stream. There's a bridge there now. It's the, apex for three big restoration projects. It has a totem pole that was put there, a healing pole that was put there by the uh, Lummi tribe. Um, and uh, so it's a very special place. It's where we staged when we were doing a lot of the restoration work. And so it has a lot of meaning for those of us that were involved with that stage of the, of the uh, event. And, and now it has a lot of meaning just because of it's an access point to the creek. I think this pipeline is pretty safe right now. I mean, there's greater regulations on this pipeline because of agreements with the city of Bellingham than there is on most any other pipeline in the country. The pipeline's also been inspected more times than most any other pipeline in the country, and we have more valves to prevent these types of things in the future. You know, you talk to people now in the pipeline world or the oil refinery world, this pipeline's the safest pipeline in America. It's the most monitored pipeline in America. I would hope that uh, when something as bad as this happens in our small town, you know, and we lose three of our young people and uh, lose sort of our sense of security about some of our public places and that sort of thing, that it would, it would remain top of mind, but 10 years is a long time. The, the, the energy that resulted from that, the energy in the community that resulted from that uh, explosion and that tragedy and turning that energy into something uh, tangible and concrete, uh, like strengthen laws, uh, I think is a, is a good example that can be applied anywhere to, to any, any set of issues. A small town in Northwest Washington that is united and determined can, 
can make a fundamental change in the regulatory environment that affects one of the most powerful and wealthy business interests in the United States, that is the oil industry.